uh, not the next promotion at work, the next relational goal met, the next financial threshold uh, seen to. The, the destination that we are longing for on this journey of life. We are homeward bound. We are headed for life in a new earth with Jesus forever. And that is our longing, isn't it? We, we feel when we, we walk through trials and sadnesses and griefs and brokenness in this world, it, one of the effects it should have on us is to increase in us our ache for that day when all sadness will be uh, wiped away, when all tears will be dried, and when justice and truth and harmony will reign in a perfect world where Jesus is king forever. We want to see those streams of glory in the new earth where our souls will be fulfilled and satisfied forever. But whilst we're here, whilst we still have breath and we're still in this world, isn't it our longing and our passion that we would see our barren and waste places watered by the life of that kingdom of heaven now? Isn't that what Jesus taught us to pray? He didn't teach us to pray. Your kingdom will get too soon. Your will will realize soon. He said, your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Lord Jesus, may we live in this life seeing as much as possible of the inbreaking of heaven's life and healing and joy and restoration as is possible. We long to see on this journey of life, we don't just have a destination, but we long to see our barren and waste places watered by the restoration that comes from God alone. And that is what Psalm 126 is about. Psalm 126 is a psalm for the journey of life. It's a psalm of ascent. It was a, a one of a collection of psalms that were sung by pilgrims, journeyers on their way towards the destination of meeting God for worship. <laughs> in Jerusalem. And in the midst of this journey, we find this psalm that is written to reflect on days of previous national renewal, but is clearly written from within days of national spiritual dryness and barrenness. And so on the journey of life, the pilgrim pens these words to cry out that God would bring that watering restoration of his kingdom in the here and now. And I really feel as we're ending this weekend, and this has been a season that I've been living in all of this year, and I'll share a little bit about some of that in, in just a moment. Um, I really feel that God is inviting us, Grace Church Cardiff, existing in Grangetown and in Canton, to organise our lives around contending for his restoration in our city, and in our nation. Let me say that again. I really need a drink of water. So <laughs> let me say it, and then I will leave it land with dramatic, intentional silence while I drink. I really believe God is inviting us to organise our lives around contending for his restoration in our city and in our nation. I don't believe God wants us to settle for anything less than this. I don't believe God wants us to sleepwalk our way to glory. But I believe he is calling Grace Church Cardiff to be a people who live wide awake to the glory of Jesus. And who live wide awake to the need in the land. And who place their lives between those two poles, arms stretched wide in both directions. And saying, Jesus, more of the glory of your grace and your forgiveness of sin and your cleansing and your redemption and your reconciliation. Jesus, more of your glory <coughs> in the broken world in which we live. How do we organise our lives around this longing and contending?
for restoration in our day. I think Psalm 126 teaches us three really, really basic steps. Firstly, if we're going to contend for more of God's restoration to come to our communities and our lives, we need to remember God's great restorative works. We need to remember what God has done. Will we be a people who keep the memory fresh and alive of the restorative works of God. Look how the psalm starts. When, when the Lord restored the fortunes of Zion, we were like those who dreamed. The psalmist unashamedly dives into the past. And I like to think of it, this image came to me earlier this week actually, as I was speaking on this psalm at a Canterbury prayer night. It's like the psalmist has got a bow and arrow in hand. And if you want that arrow to go anywhere, what's the first thing you have to do? You stretch back that rope. And if you want that arrow to fly far, you take that rope back as far as you can with every ounce of muscle energy within you. And this is what the psalmist does here. He looks back to a former day of God's restoring work. Look at the language that he uses. This is likely used to describe uh, a time when Israel was in captivity and in exile, but a time when God restored them, freed them, liberated them, and brought them back to their land. The psalmist says it was like we were like those who dream. What does he mean in, in this? It's like living in a dream world, but I think it's also underlying that it was, it was a time when it was so evident that God was working among them. Because actually, when do you dream? You dream when you're asleep. (laughs) And so when it says we were like those who dream, it was like, whilst we were just going along with our everyday existence, it was like God invaded our reality. It wasn't us. It wasn't when the Lord restored the fortunes of Zion, we were like those who worked really, really hard. It was our work that brought God's restoration. No. No. This was a time when God was sovereignly showing up in amazing power. We were like those who dream God is doing it, not us. Our mouth was filled with laughter. Our tongues were shouts of of joy. Is Isaac in the room? Is Isaac coffee in the room? He's in the room. We have our little laughter in the room. He is sleeping and dreaming. Uh, He's my visual uh, uh, illustration this morning. Um, This reminds me of the story of Isaac in the scriptures. Abraham and Sarah living not in a barren land, but in the barrenness of their own bodies, get told by God, you're going to have a son in your old age, and so overwhelmed with disbelief are they, they name the son Isaac. Laughter, that's what it means. And that's what this son is like. We couldn't believe it. We were literally falling off our chairs laughing. Like, shouts of joy. God is just so at work restoring brokenness and bringing life where there's barrenness and darkness and death. Overcome with gladness. Disbelief. They said among the nations, the Lord has done great things for them. So significant was what God did amongst this little community, remnant, captive Israelites, weak and and, and, uh, hopeless, that the nations began to wake up and say, there must be a God in Israel. The Lord has done great things for them. The nations are waking up. We can't deny his reality. Will we remember such days in our own life? What is our when the Lord restored? What is our memory that God is calling us to to stretch back into and remember today? When the Lord restored. Friends, if you belong to Jesus, then the greatest resurrection, restoration, awakening, revival has already happened to you. We talk of, I've spoken a lot this year of my heart for revival having come awake. But do you know what? Revival can so often, restoration, these big words, can so often seem like a category that's like for superhero Christians. But actually, if you read the pages of the New Testament, 
If you've simply put your trust in the Lord Jesus as your Lord and Saviour, it's happened to you already. You are the walking, talking, exhibit A of God's restoration, restoring, reviving work. In Ephesians 2, this is what it says. That God found us when we were dead in our trespasses and sins. We weren't neutral spiritually, we were dead. And by his mercy, it says, by the lavish, undeserved mercy of God, he has made us alive with Christ. By grace we have been saved and raised up and seated with Christ in heavenly places. This has already happened to every one of us that believes in Jesus. We have undergone spiritual restoration, revival, resurrection. When the Lord restored is already in our history if we belong to Jesus. How much did your salvation depend on you when the Lord restored you? We were like those who worked really... No. Nope. We were like those who dreamed. Jesus found me when I was far from him, when I was lost and broken and dead in my sin. Our tongue was filled with shouts of joy. Peter referred to this yesterday morning, but we all can look back, I'm sure, at those moments that came when we realised, I'm a sinner... And I stand under the judgment of a holy God. And without Jesus, I'm heading for death and an eternity of separation from the God I was born to be in right relationship with. And there's that moment that comes where we realize because Jesus has died on my, in my place, he's been substituted for me. He took the punishment. Now I can take his glory. I can be reconciled and restored to God. I don't know of any other thing that, uh, as someone already said it this morning, right, Michelle, I can't remember, that this is the best. That it doesn't get any, Caroline, it doesn't get, any, there's no better news than this. There's no better news than this. And what Jesus has done for us when the Lord restored us. The problem is we forget. We wander, we drift from what God has has done in Christ for us. And if we're going to be a people who organise our lives around contending for restoration to come in our communities, it starts by remembering what God has done for us. It starts by us joining our prayers to that of King David in Psalm 51, who, remember, wrote these words from the pit of failure. But said in Psalm 51, verse 11, Restore to me the joy of my salvation. So what God's inviting us into is to have a restored joy in our salvation. Restored joy in what God has done for us in Christ. This revival that has come to us if we belong to Jesus. When the Lord restored. Don't bury those memories. I want to encourage you, live close to the time that Jesus saved you. Live close to that memory. Don't bury them. Often God has put in that time when you first came to faith the deposits and the signals of what he wants your life with him to be about. Restore to us, remember the joy of our salvation, but you may have other moments of restoration you can look back to in your journey following Jesus. How often do we spend time pulling back the bowstring, remembering? How often do we do that in regards to what God has done in the land of Wales? This land that was known as a place to say, the Lord has done great things for them. The nations have been saying it, the Lord has done great things for us and we are glad. Friends, which of the nations on earth right now is looking at Wales and saying the Lord is doing great things for them? Does that, are we okay with that? That our city and our nation is known for other things? Are we okay with that? Are we settled with that? When actually our land, like I said, has known days of great 
mighty outpouring of blessing. I've read a lot about the 1859 revival in Wales this year, and this is what it says in one of the books, that about 110,000 were converted and added to the churches as a result of the 1859 revival in Wales. The Calvinistic, Methodist and Congregational churches each received about 36,000 new members, the Baptists about 14,000, the Wesleyans about 5,000, and the established church about 20,000. A typical statement of the nature of the work accomplished during the revival is given by Thomas Jones in October 1859. The addition to the churches amount to many thousands far greater than it has ever been known in Wales within the same period. You, as you read these stories, they're just like numbers in many ways, but when you think of the countless individual lives that were being touched and, and changed by the restoration that is found in the gospel alone, when we remember those days of what God has done, doesn't it cause an ache and longing for us to see it again? Getting an imagination for what is possible when the Lord moves in power, it starts by remembering what he has done. We need to return to the past. What does the enemy want? He wants to lull you to sleep. He wants, you to, he wants to lower your expectations. He wants you to settle for less. He wants you to resign yourself to a comfortable and compromised Christianity. He wants you to forget what is possible with our God. It's really challenged with this, about Cardiff in particular. I once watched a documentary about Cardiff that spoke of how Cardiff, of all UK cities, is, um, is, is known amongst city planners as being a city that ruthlessly and relentlessly knocks down old buildings and builds new ones. Um, just a disinterest in its past. And I just felt, even this morning, thinking about this, that maybe there's something in the air <laughs> that we breathe of like, you know, the, 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 the future is now and, and, and what matters is, is what's to come and what, what is, and that's all very true. But there's power in remembering what God has done. There's power in remembering what the Lord has done. And if we're going to contend and believe for more, it will start with pulling back that bowstring. But the second thing I want to say that this psalm tells us to do is not just remember God's past restoration, but to sow, to sow our lives for a great restoration of God. The psalmist takes the memory, he harnesses the bow, and what does he do? He prays. Restore our fortunes, O Lord, like streams in the Negev. Those who sow in tears shall reap with shouts of joy doesn't get stuck in the past memory, doesn't become cynical, that was then, this is now, it doesn't become nostalgic, but he harnesses the past memory of what God has done, and he uses that to springboard into a believing, dreaming, praying, sowing, weeping, mm. present. He takes the memory of what God has done, and he calls, Lord, restore our fortune. Restore our fortunes. Sometimes when the church has got its back against the wall and when decline has come to the church and the land, the, the, the temptation is to innovate. Find the latest trick. Find the latest novel thing. Find the latest new brand and new technique that will turn the tide and attract people to church. Notice, you don't once find in the book of Psalms the word innovate. Help us innovate, Lord. You find a lot in the book of Psalms, the word restore. Mm. Restore us. What we need is not something new, but something really old. We need the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ. That is where the power is located. There is no other power that fuels the growth of the church in our day. It's not power of personalities. It's not power of gifted preachers. It's not power of great worship. It's not power of good lighting or chair arrangements, as I sometimes am tempted to think. It's not power of this thing or the next thing. The power is in the gospel of Jesus. And so our prayer and our longing, when we look back at what's possible in our past and in the past of the land, and when we look at the brokenness and decay and decline of the church in our day, where do we return? We return to the power of the gospel. 
In no other name, there is no other name given under heaven by which we might be saved. It's in the name of Jesus Christ alone. And so we take the memory and we pray, Lord, restore us to the power of the name of Jesus. Wake your church up again to not settle for less than the power that is in that gospel. Do you know what Jesus called the gospel? He called it a seed. Do you know what a seed is? A seed is something tiny and foolish. What a foolish what a, what a foolish proposition that from something that can fit in the palm of my hand, an oak tree would come. Look at it and think, foolishness. And yet, if you plant that thing, put it under the right conditions, that thing can bring shade for generations. Jesus said the gospel is like a seed. You might be, you look, look at your hand and think, we ain't gone a lot, Grace Church Cardiff. We feel pretty empty-handed, even this weekend, we feel pretty broken. We're really mindful of our weakness and our lack of resource. And then we put our hands in our pocket and we think, oh, but we have got this little seed. (laughs) Jesus Christ, Son of God. Jesus Christ died for sin, buried, raised on the third day. I wonder what happens if I restore some of my faith in this seed. I wonder what happens if we sow this gospel seed. The psalmist in this prayer restores, he has these two images. It's all to do with watering and growth and, and, and bringing life and restoration to this barren landscape. And the first one is this image of sudden flooding. Restore us like streams in the Negev. In this barren landscape could be transformed into fertile, bountiful land by flash flooding. And the psalmist says, God, we've seen past good days. We're living in present evil and dark days. Hey, you're still God. You're still powerful. The gospel still works. Why don't we see a flash flood, Lord? And I think part of what God has been stirring in me this year is this imagination Growing my horizons and my imagination through reading about 1859 and other things. It's time to get shamelessly audacious. What are we expecting to happen? Why don't we, why don't we pray, restore our fortunes like streams in the Negev, Lord? Let's, let's ask God to flood this land, a land where less than 2% of people describe themselves as kind of gospel-believing Christians. A land where less than 3% of young people have any meaningful engagement with local church, why don't we start praying, flood it, God. Like, seriously, let, I, we can't even begin to start like with all the, the brokenness and the chaos. We need you to restore our fortunes, just flood. Restore us and flood us. There was a song of my youth that I've listened to a lot recently. It's called Tears of the Saints, and I've done a lot of crying this year, so I found myself returning to it. Listen to these words. There are many prodigal sons. On our city streets they run, searching for shelter. There are homes broken down. People's hopes have fallen to the ground from failure. And listen to this. This is an emergency. This is an emergency. There are tears from the saints for the lost and unsaved. We're crying for them come back home. Come back home. This is an emergency, Lord. Flood our land with the power of the gospel. And you know, I want to just share that the church in Cardiff, I really believe, is waking up to this. For me, this started on 14th of January this year, where a passion that I've always carried since the days of my youth to see revival in Wales came awake before the eyes of some people in this room. You might remember the 14th of January, uh, if you were there. Um, If you were, let me remind you. If not, let me just describe. I was preaching on Psalm 44, a psalm of revival. And at the end of the message, very unexpectedly, I just began uncontrollably weeping. And um, that, to me, I said to Ali, 
after the service, as Pro said, with Howard, I remember David came and prayed with me, and you know, all of you kind of, you know, God was in the room. I know other people were moved and kind of repenting over our sins and calling for God to heal the Lamb, but I remember saying to Ali, I think this would be a before and after moment for me. And it has been. This year, I just felt this passion wake up within me, and, and what I've begun to see happen is that God is stirring things around our city of Cardiff in particular. There is new warmth of relationship growing between leaders and churches as we recognize we can't get on with the status quo. We need a flood. We need a flood. And all of our organizing and resourcing and working and laboring, that's good, and we'll get to that in a second, and that's where I'm going to end. But we really need a flood of God's presence, don't we? And I've had the privilege, the unexpected privilege and opportunity of being asked by many city leaders if they've heard my story of how God's waking me up in this. Like, Owen, can you help us facilitate a new day of united prayer in the city? This is what we need for our day, is not getting on in our own cloistered little places with business as usual, but calling the church to a new day of desperate prayer for God to restore us. What's this space in terms of what comes from all of this? But I think for us, it's an invitation to join our hearts and our faith and our imagination to God flooding the land again. This is an emergency. But the second thing that the psalmist draws upon, he looks at sudden flood, but then he also looks at slow farming. (laughs) One way that God rewaters the land and brings restoration is sudden flood. The other way is those who sow in tears shall reap with shouts of joy. Friends, until the flood comes, until, and I'm praying that I will see this in my lifetime. I'm getting this into the language of our boys. Toby said to me at a mealtime the other day, Dad, I wonder if I'll see revival by the time I'm a teenager. And I thought, wow, he's, he's, uh, he's getting it, he's getting it. And then he stopped himself and he said, well, maybe I'll see it in my childhood. <laughs> I thought, yes, believe him for this. But until we see the flood, and with the song we're going to sing at the end, you know, is, is a heart cry, even if we don't see it in our lifetime. Mm-hmm. I guess our options are, We put ourselves on the shelf. We let someone else care about this. Or we sow in tears. Mm -hmm. We take the gospel seed, sow it in the ground, and we take our hearts and we keep them soft before the Lord. We, We do all we can to keep our hearts soft before the Lord. Forgiving where there's been offense caused. Keep my heart soft. I don't want to grieve you, Holy Spirit. Getting before the word and in prayer every day. Keep my heart soft before the Lord. We just pray day by day with our weeping prayers and our desperate and our simple and our ordinary prayers. It was so in the gospel in youth work and kids work and Sundays and book tables and choirs and whatever else. We just faithfully do the work of just rewatering the ground. Water is water. And so if a tear falls to the ground on a place where there is a seed waiting to be fertilized into life, it can have an effect. If many tears <laughs> fall into the ground where a seed has been sown and is waiting to be fertilized and grow into life, it can have an effect. It can bring life. Will we be those who in the meantime Just join our hearts and our lives in desperate and devoted prayer, in desperate and devoted sowing and praying for the gospel to do its work in lives today. That's what I think God is inviting us into in this next season in Grace Church, Cardiff. We've gone over our time, but I do want us to sing this song to close in just a moment. But before we get there, and what I need to end in this way. There's a promise here in Psalm 126. Those who sow in tears will return with songs of joy, carrying sheaves with them. I've been inspired 
by 1859 this year. But this is not just a past thing, friends. Let me read to you a social media post from a church in Abersuchen. Abersuchen is in the eastern valley of oh. Wales. It's a forgotten community. Uh, it's not far from where I grew up. And um, there's this chapel in Abersuchen called Nodva Chapel. I preached there about 12 years ago. Um, and I preached there to 12 people when I preached there 12 years ago. Sadly, I say this, typical Valley's Chapel. Known better days, known revival days, known great days of the Lord's restoration, the Lord has done great things for us. But right now, living in spiritual darkness and barrenness and decay, over the last 10 years, there have been some faithful saints who have laid down their lives and laid down gospel seed in that community. And this social media post was shared by their pastor, John, um, a few weeks ago. It's a few weeks ago. This is a sheave. <laughs> it's one of the sheaves I'm bringing to you this morning. This is what he says. I believe we experienced, even but for a moment, revival on Sunday. And he puts in brackets, this is from a very conservative Baptist. <laughs> I write this with tears. During Sunday service, God came in power to our little Welsh Valley Church, Nova. We began with prayer, took communion together, and sang. A normal Sunday, it would seem. Around 150 in the congregation. Nobody could sit down. There was a pure and powerful silence, followed by weeping. We were all in shock and awe. Time became an illusion. We could have been there all day for all we knew. Everything just stopped. It was authentic, unplanned, all of God. By God's grace, salvation came, especially to the young. We tasted heaven for a moment. Revival is real. The stories are true. Jesus died and rose again. We are forgiven. It's beautiful, isn't it? Are we going to contend for this kind of restoration in our day? Are we going to contend for it? Stretching our hands out to the glory of the gospel and the power of Jesus. Stretching our hands out to the brokenness of the world. Standing in the middle with this heart cry, <laughs> restore us, O Lord. Are we going to contend for it? And even if we don't see it in our lifetime, and even if we don't see it in Grangetown and in Canton, are we going to give our lives to praying that God's blessing might come and might flood our city and our land, wherever and whatever it looks like? Are we going to be that people? I believe God is inviting us to be that people. And so we're going to stand and sing this final song which expresses this longing that we might see a great awakening, a great outpouring of God's Spirit in our day. Let's stand together. I think just.